Si vous avez un de marqué suite dans Chinatown, dans Manhattan, vous avez un mot de Yeah, I found something near here. Right. We should go. But why is it so cheap? Buick Centurio convertible with an automatic opening for you and I. And you look like an American actress in it. <laughs>
last year in spring, somebody put on the internet that I wanted to come to America to play, and uh, after two days, I had 15 offers. All this tour is now three months throughout America, about 55 concerts, I think, unbelievable. And then I realized this uh, dream of a 15 years old German boy. I bought a big station wagon, large ass, excuse me the expression. But the bass fits and a couple of other things. Laurence from Paris with her film stuff, because she's following me on the tour, trying to grab all these encounters, all the meetings with musicians I most of the time hadn't played with before. Now I'm here, wonderful, thank you. I'm Peter Koval. Thank you so much for coming. I know I'm, a, I'm a quite a serious person, and my music is quite serious. And then you bring in this, let's say, Dada side of it. And that's serious too, but it's funny at the same time. And so it's very essential human stuff. Yeah. Oh, so I really thought this was very close to uh, to the crazy, basic, good things of life. Oh, that's yeah. great, <laughs> great. We get paid and then we go eat. Oh, yeah. Then we go we eat. Get paid too. Okay. Right. Sometimes people come to me and say, "Do you get paid? Do you get paid for this?" <laughs> <laughs> I always feel not so good about it. It makes noises, it gets hot, it needs a lot of oil. But so far it has taken us. I want to take it to the garage tomorrow and have it checked. So let's hope. Frankfurt. Okay. Right, thank you. Frankfurt. Okay. So the army? Yeah. When, when was that? Uh, 69, 68. Okay. Four months I got shipped to Vietnam. All right. Yeah. And you stayed a long I time stayed, in Vietnam? I uh, stayed in Vietnam like um, eight months I got shot. Oh, yeah? Yeah. 
It was a bit more of us, something else. Yeah, how old are you? I'm 55. Uh, 48. No, not 48, uh, 49. Yeah. Soon be 50. Yeah. Okay, man. Okay. You have a nice face. All right, like thank this. you. All right, bye bye. Okay, thank you, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad too. It's been really uh, a wish for a long time, so I'm glad. that last night as I was listening to him perform. Peter's music is the sound of change to me because whenever I'm faced with a big change there's all this emotion and, and tension and you know even if it's a good change there's still tension in, in changes and because you're for, I'm forced to learn something new or do something new and get out of my natural comfort level and the sounds that Peter makes are the sounds that I hear in my head when I'm going through a change. It's that sound of tension and harmony and discord. And that's what I like about Peter's music. I've been following the, uh, the Black Struggle since mm -hmm. the 60s, Martin Luther King, and I just wondered if it would be possible to talk to you a little bit about oh, it. Sure. Yeah. It just it just uh, you know uh, breathtaking that the yeah. thing that he represented, you know, bringing trying to bring people together. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily now a black or white yeah. thing, but it's people. Yeah. Maybe I'll go to New Orleans tomorrow. Oh I'm yeah. Looking forward to that. You know? Oh wow, that'll yeah. be great. Yeah. So y'all traveling the world. Yeah, we bought an old station wagon and mm -hmm. all the stuff and we travel Oh this this good. Yeah. You, you need a driver? Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, thank you. Joe, Larissa Gray here, Peter Kovald's friend. How are you? The blue station wagon for Peter Kovald. Let's just say this. Uh, we, we must have the car today at, at um, yeah. Yeah, before two o'clock, absolutely.
Monday, New Time, New Time, New Time, New Time. If your name be now, my baby. I'm mad. Oh, stress. Post the magic stress. I see you. Possible. Bring together separate companies, put them in a moment. Question. She's a lieutenant. She's a lieutenant. I'll be joined there for my three more years. My grace. Why you do it? You told me I ain't got it right. Wireless. Bell Atlantic Mobile, AirTouch, Cellular, and Bronco have united to create Verizon Wireless. Before the bridge. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. Good timing, too. You have time to relax beforehand. Good to see you. Good to see you. Larissa. Hi. Hey, Larissa. Very nice to meet you. Good evening. Hi. I mean, good afternoon. Souls like us, that's all we got to do. We got yeah, to find yeah. one another out. Yeah. Wherever we at, we got to get together and do it. 
So whenever I go, you know, we got to find these kind of cats that we can play with. Get on the stand and play some music. Just improvise. That's what it's about. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very good. Did you sleep well? Yes. Good. Little hangover. Me too, and I didn't even drink last night. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Hi. Uh, morning. We're the... There's a saying about New Orleans, we say we're third world and proud because we, we sort of run our city like a third world city. We're dependent on tourism and, and hoping that people will come here to uh, have conventions and do the things they don't do in their own cities. <laughs> Out-of-towners like to use New Orleans as their saloon, whorehouse. And they come here to go crazy and to let loose. Then they go back home and behave and make money again. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, John, this is Rob. I got a surprise for you. Peter. Hey, John, this is Peter Covert. OK, how you doing? I wonder if you would find the time to spend maybe an hour with us. Yeah? OK, we can see him tomorrow at 4 o'clock, John Sinclair. Who is he? The, I think he was a, most of the white countries, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's a political the founder or something, co-founder, poet, and journalist about jazz music, and yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. African American musicians in our style, people are talking about it. Like, there are very few. Black people who come to the concerts, right. usually it's white people, usually it's white middle class too. Now I see it myself wherever yep. I go now. Well, so they are not happy about this. Yes. African American community is the most oppressed in terms of culture. I mean, to me it's the sickest part of American life is that most black people have never heard a good record. Mm -hmm. Never heard, they don't know who Muddy Waters is. I don't know who Miles Davis was. Geez. Sometimes I'd give performances for kids in school, black kids sometimes. I'd do my pieces about blues and jazz. First time they've ever heard of any of this. Just don't have any idea. And to me, that's the saddest part of the whole thing. Now, not only have they deprived these people of any economic and educational opportunities by tracking them out of the system. At the same time, what reflection of it is, they're villainized. <laughs> mm -hmm. These people are, what's wrong with America today, these niggers? If we could get rid of them, we'd just have a rosy suburban world where everybody would be happy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's so sick, you know? Yeah. I mean, when I think, I mean, when you sit down and think about it or try to articulate it, it just wrenches your guts, man. It's just so ugly. <laughs> Y'all leave today? Yes, we're leaving now. Where you going now? Uh, Texas, and then California, and... Ooh. You're going down, that way. Yeah. Are you driving the car? Yeah. Damn.
bought the place four years ago, and it was abandoned. The upstairs for 70 years. There are 10,000 pairs of women's shoes on the second floor that were left over from the 60s of the stores that shut down. And so it's a repository of objects of the 20th century. We take the things that were already here and just move them like a river through the place in, for people to experience. Um, many different types of people come here. Some are college students, some are artists, musicians, some are homeless street people, some are mentally ill schizophrenics, some are bankers and lawyers and doctors. Um, oh, the town is very segregated by money. This place breaks down a lot of those barriers. Three tires fucked up. No. So I moved it. It was very dark there. I just moved it to this big parking place because I, I'm afraid they break in the windows too when it looks so fucked up, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have to go in the morning and get some tires. Mm. Ed has got a very large pickup truck that he's going to take everything yeah, back. Not quite and, that big, but no. pretty close. Yeah. All right. Is take it us all here? Anyway. Yeah, it's around the corner. I'll bring Good it up. Ed. You're a good boy. I'm trying.
Peter. Welcome to Texas. Hello. I'm Peter Kowal from bass player from Germany. Just arrived in Texas, first time in my life. Hi to everybody. <laughs> you, you've been playing for over over 30 years now in the improvised music community. Right. People use often the term free improvisation, and free is a very ambitious term. I mean, in thousands of years of philosophy and, uh, and social and political movements and uh, activities. Uh, I would reduce it for the moment uh, to a very simple level and say free in improvisation means that it's free of a pre-given form. And when we look at all the music of the world and through the history of it and now all local, quote unquote, local music, music which came out of a uh, local context which basically all music did, I mean Bach too and Mozart too, there was a local, however large it was, local con uh, context, uh, use form. And since the mid of, uh, of the last century, since the 60s basically, there's a group of people, a network finally all over the world, of people who don't want to use any form anymore, any local form. Uh, since then, musicians from all over the world just can meet without maybe even being able to speak a language being themselves and just play together because the form is completely open. I'm quite aware now that my history as a German young man growing up, uh, I'm born 44, so in the late 40s as a kid and in the 50s, and fascism and Hitler had misused German tradition completely in the sense that they had occupied it. So after the war, after 45, and me growing up in this, uh, I didn't want, and most of the people didn't want to sing a German song because it has immediately this uh, terrible smell of fascism. And so basically I've been uh, a musical traveler since, and actually it was always my love to, to uh, be in contact with uh, what the other cultures had to say. Okay, that's it. Navajo radio. So maybe we go there. Let's see where it is. I'm a musician touring in the United States. Oh, really? For three months. Let's see there's three people in Texas and California who want to come. And cool. uh, show my respect. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. <laughs> now, this okay. is uh, another production room. I'm working on this one right now. This is one of the old squaw dance songs. This comes from a traditional ceremony. And this is some of the songs that, that's played or that they sing. So this is a traditional music. Yeah. Um, based on our ancestors, the world is going to come to an end when everybody speaks one language and that's English. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we still speak our native tongue to preserve our life. Mm. I love my job. I have fans all over the place. They like, they listen to me every single day. I tell jokes. I tell traditional stories on the radio, at, especially at night. Like now, I'm on the radio. Good evening to all the Western listeners. That's why we are called.
It's not every day someone asks how long your torso is. Roger Rosenblatt considers the notion of an online university. Michael Saylor, a 35-year-old software billionaire, though dwindling, still... it a little bit more. It was a little bit wavy. So let's just focus it on a three minute piece and really play it with all our heart. <laughs> it's just an expression. Okay.
made for European sound, but now I come along and say, I don't want so much European sounds, I want other sounds, so I have to put my finger in another way. And then suddenly you come to a position where suddenly this bass makes a kick that you didn't want to be there. But then you just lay back and say, this beat is another sound. Even I didn't expect it, I repeat it, and then you repeat it, and then you repeat it again. So that stuff which you used to call mistakes and still is when you play Mozart or when you play scales in jazz or whatever, they basically in this music is so open, there is no mistake. If you do it again, and if you repeat it, it's immediately structure. It's not a mistake anymore. Or you can turn the mistake into structure. And this is what I love about this music too. Yes. No mistakes. I always did these mistakes in the classical music. And I said, well, maybe I try to go somewhere where, where there are not so many mistakes to be made. <laughs>
Today is May 1st, the International Workers' Day. So if you were at home in France, everything would be shut. But here in the United States, the government and the right-wing labor union leaders have gotten together and suppressed May Day. They have May Day in um, September in the United States, the only country in the world that doesn't celebrate it on the 1st of May. And it's ironic because May Day actually started as a commemoration of a big struggle in Chicago back in 1886 for the eight-hour day and to abolish the wage system. So May Day's always had a very revolutionary anti-capitalist side, but the capitalists of the United States don't want us to know about it. So they hid it. But some of us know about it, and we celebrate it anyway. Workers of the world unite. That's what we think. <laughs> As long as I don't run into someone thinking about it in front of me. <laughs> Next stop is Broadway. What's happening is that people are just massively being evicted from their homes and their studios in the city. And um, it's kind of like what's going to be left is the very, very wealthiest and the very, very poorest. Because they're so poor, they can't afford a place to live no matter how cheap the rent is. Mm -hmm. So it's not changing their situation, except that now they're surrounded by these new people who don't care about them. <laughs> Because it, it used to be that you had people who were very, very poor and then people who were kind of poor. Mm -hmm. And the people who were kind of poor are the people who have the most sympathy for the people who are very, very poor. Mm -hmm.
before you make this thing, you have to, you, you're going to think like, uh, oh, it has to be that way, it has to be that way. It doesn't always work that way. So you just grab rock and do it, do your best. You don't think. No, no. Use all your feelings. Hey, theory is that listening at home to the music is different than being at the gig. Absolutely. And so sometimes, in a way, the, the fresh material of a new piece is nice to have at home. And when you are at the gig, the people at the gig, then they listen the ambient, they see you play, they see you sweat and all of that. We, we know all this, but, right, it's but good somehow to it's nice to have, have a little more of a decisive aspect in the music and not so much the processing aspect. Make something to listen at home to. That's my theory, and just talking. So. There are some really great little black ghetto clubs for blues and jazz within blocks of here. <laughs> But if you wanted a real feel for what the what's left of the American ghetto music scene, it's you know, Oakland's one of the few places on the West Coast that has anything. It's very similar to Chicago and very few other places. Oh, yeah. I'm just sitting out enjoying some sun, you know, playing a little blues out here. Oh, I love blues, man. Y'all have a nice walk. Good health here. artist collective we're, we're a community of mainly black folks in Oakland California we trying to buy blocks and you know what I mean do this fight gentrification make sure we preserve these storefronts for the people of Oakland not for the people of Marin or San Francisco who hella rich and a little paler than us you know so that's what we really here for 
to hold the front line and to make sure that all power is for all the people and not for the little few, you know? So one of the things I wanted to try to do with this print was to make a picture that had representations of black men in particular that didn't display any particular event or any kind of activity or any action, but on a huge, grand, heroic scale. Okay. So it's like this great big nothing, yeah. in a way, <laughs> which in itself could be a politically charged act. Uh, yeah. I still have this idea that you can create a certain kind of political content in music by the way you juxtapose tones and things. Because what do you think? I mean, you take, say, uh, harmonic uh, structures yeah. you know, that are consistent, yeah. but then you throw in a dissonant tone right. with that. Well, I mean, that break between the break in the harmonic structure seems yeah. to suggest the same kinds of uh, ruptures that uh, you can kind of illustrate yeah. with political imagery sometimes. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who can play an instrument, but there's some people who not only play the instrument well, but they look at the limitations that the instrument imposes, and they figure out ways to, to extend that. Extend that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that's the real challenge. And then it's the real challenge of, well, how now do I structure these sounds mm -hmm. so that they show people something that they're familiar with, but also give them a glimpse of something mm. that they know, have no idea uh, about, you know? How big can I make it without it becoming so cryptic, right. you know, or so esoteric that it's not just sort of inaccessible to anybody? Mm. And so the same thing, is, that's what I'm doing with my, my paintings. Right. 
what I, I like to show when I play is to, to just show all these different sides of myself, mm -hmm. which are basically the different sides of everybody. Right, right. right. So there's a meditative side, there's an aggressive side, mm -hmm. there's a mm -hmm. romantic side or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just to try to show all my sides, and that's what I feel people understand, because mm -hmm. it touches something in them which is basically the same. Which is basically the same, and yeah. it's a transcultural too. It doesn't right, right. relate necessarily to, to uh, geographic areas. It's a basic. Some of it, definitely. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jay Bailey. Wonderful, wonderful Sunday afternoon. Here's a beautiful song, you'll love this. She wore blue, blue velvet, a blue was in velvet, wasn't I? Softer than satin were the lies of rum. From, uh, from the stars, she wore blue. <laughs> A velvet, you sweetie, I love you. I love you. 
I'm in love with you. <laughs> this was one of the instruments that was responsible for bringing about birth of blues and jazz in America. If you look at this instrument, you take a look at it, I'll give you a demonstration. Inside, there's nothing but a knot. A knot there. And when you turn it over, it creates its own acoustics. Now, if you look at the string here, the string is on an angle. And that angle, directly in the middle, you get a C note. C, D, and you get an E there. With those three notes, you can do a lot. Thank <laughs> you. 